you should attach emotion to, to situations because it clouds the mind. It's, it is what it is. Are you doing well? Great. Are you not? Well, then fix it. And how are we going to fix it in step by step? Good day. How are you? More winning, I hope. Um, some of the emails that I didn't get to last week, I got to this week. I got those wrapped up. I've been working with uh, Mr. Frank Muir. <laughs> uh, Frank is a two-time heavyweight champion, both times, yeah? Yep, two-time heavyweight champion. Two-time heavyweight yes. champion, so held, held the title of baddest man in the world for uh, a few hundred days, yeah? Yeah. Uh, Frank has been training with me the last couple days. He's full. Sometimes I should show up on the call, some sweaty like this. You know, I don't wear a suit. I just look like what I look like today. If, I, if I've been on a construction site all day, sometimes I show up with construction dust. If I've been training with a you know, world champion fighter, sometimes I show up looking like this. And I just, I just feel, like, this is the real shit, you know, that in a fucking, uh, in a TV ad or some bullshit ad on the internet, you might see some, some dude looking real pretty and, you know, enjoying all this success. But, uh, you know, in, in your career, you know, what, what percentage of the time did you, you spend looking, you know, like a, like a male model in front of a camera versus being fucking like, you know, sweaty and tender and, and doing tough shit? Yeah, basically maybe the, the week of the fight, you know, when you walk around doing some of the media there, but, you know, the... the the, uh, the rest of the 300 and, you know, basically 55 days of your life, uh, no, we're, I'm, I'm walking around in sweats and just comfortable and just, because, you know, you're training, working hard, and, and you got to prioritize things. Are you going to sit at home and prioritize getting dressed, looking sharp, and making sure that, you know, <clears throat> that everything's cleaned up and going? Are you prioritizing what phone calls you have to make that day, what your workout schedule, how are you going to eat, who are you going to call, how are you going to talk? You know, and just that consumes my mind a lot more than, you know, making sure that I'm wearing a brand new suit, you know. <laughs> If, if you showed up at the gym looking pretty, what would your competitor think if, oh. if he's training hard for, he's at, you know, how long are your fight camps? Like, you know, eight weeks, 10, 12? Yeah, uh, well, at the beginning, I used to do 10 weeks. I thought that was important, but I realized it was too much wear and tear. And so I actually started cutting down almost six to eight weeks towards the end of my career. Just And I realized if you stayed in shape year round at 70, 80%, then it only took six weeks to get ready for a fight. Whereas if you, you know, you needed those 12 week camps because, you basically, if you stopped working out and just, you know, and, and took time off, too much time to enjoy life, well, then you had to pay the price in the camp. And so I'd rather just go and train every day and enjoy myself and then bring it up for a shorter period of time than to uh, completely live a life of debauchery and then try to fix it in three months. What would your opposition think if, uh, you know, not, if he's seen you looking pretty, you're, you're out on the town looking pretty, dressed up in a suit, chilling? And he's training his ass off for for his fight with upcoming with you. And then he hears from other guys in your community, other other fighters or other elite fighters. Oh yeah, Frank's just been chilling. Oh, yeah. nobody's seen him in the gym. Yeah, that kind of talk actually brings people confidence, and it's funny they'll actually maybe even train a little less, you know, more because like all oh, the other guys kind of, you know, he's screwing up. He's not training hard. Then you know maybe I don't have to put it in. And so I actually use that to my advantage. Where like you know I'll go out somewhere at a club and come in and hang out, and I'm drinking water, you know, and just. I want to give you the, the uh, appearance that I'm taking it easy and I'm chilling out, and you know, so that maybe the other guy, you know, I'm perfectly, purposely trying to give back that perception of, of oh man, this guy's dialing it in, he's enjoying life, he's uh, you know at restaurants, hanging out, and you know, you know, have anybody seen him at the gym? I've been training, I just didn't train in front of everybody, so I would have camps and even held my own gym for a while, and I locked the doors for that purpose because I didn't want the other guy to realize what actually I was doing and what the kind of hard work I was putting into, so that he would actually. Oh man, you know, I see you're, you're enjoying life, and I'm gonna pull back on the uh, the work ethic I, I have, and then maybe I can catch people then with their pants now. Look what we got. We got two world champions training with us this week. Um, you guys know Paul. Paul has been on several times with different clients, but you, you, I think you've been. I think it's your second appearance on the uh, on this mm -hmm. program on the mentoring calls. But uh, for those that don't know, you know, Paulie Malinaj, he's also a multi-time world champion, two different weight divisions, and. I mean, these guys literally you know, beat up some of the, the toughest and most talented dudes in the world in their respective sports. And so you know, Frank and I were just talking about, you know, looking pretty. That you're, you're still in your training clothes. Mm -hmm. Frank changed his shirt. Cause he's. Uh, I tried, but I still sweated through it from my workout. I'm drenched in sweat over here. And, you know, the, you know a program about entrepreneurship, where you know, I just explained to them that, like, you, you got to be concerned about your results. It might not look pretty. The, the process might not look pretty. As long as the results are beautiful, then... You know, everything worked out just fine. You, you have a thought about that? Yeah, sometimes the uh, re the journey is is difficult work. It's uh, it's it's not pretty. It's not comfortable. You know, but 
the overall goal has to remain the uh, on the mindset. Uh, they say the journey is the reward in the end because when you go through it and you accomplish, when you look back on that journey, you remember the difficult moments the most, the moments where you thought maybe you wanted to quit or maybe you wanted to just give in. You'd say, oh, maybe this just isn't worth it or maybe this just isn't for me. And, uh, you know, if you're able to overcome those moments, first of all, it puts you at, in a different percentile of human being because most people will just give in in those moments, in those tough decision-making moments. And then they are just moments. You know, I remember I read uh, Teddy Alice's biography and uh, he was actually bringing this up with the psychology of a fighter and the psychology in life where difficult moments are just moments. If you can just kind of stay calm and get through that moment, then there'll be another moment and another moment, you know, and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but they're just moments. Nothing's ever consistent in life. So if you're, if, if a tough moment makes you quit, then, you know, you need to work on your character a little bit because if you're able to keep on going through those tough moments, eventually you'll get to better pastures and you'll eventually, you pass enough of those, you'll reach that ultimate goal. And then you can look back and say, man, those tough moments, I'm so happy I got through them because you know what, it makes this all the more rewarding. Uh, about three thoughts came up that, uh, that I thought were really uh, special and, and noteworthy in there. That, um, you know, one was the temporality, and maybe the least important is just the temporality that it's, it's a temporary feeling that like, mm -hmm. I never, you guys see me, and you, know, you know me really well, and mm -hmm. Frank knows me a bit, and you guys see me have great days in the stock market, you see me have shit days in the stock market, and you've been around me enough to know like I'm, I'm a pretty even mood either way, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't get too cocky or too excited if, uh, you know, today I'm up over 1.3, about one and a third million. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not so cocky about it. And, you know, and yesterday I was down a little over 400 grand, you know, and I wasn't too bummed about it then. I was just like, I was, it didn't change what we ate for dinner. It didn't change. I'm, I'm still going to be in a fucking penthouse high up in the sky. I'm still going to have, uh, you know, my life ain't changing, you know. And some people, they panic about that. They get excited, you know, they, they, they think they're traders. They're not investors, they're traders. And you know, you're, you're trading yourself out of a prosperous future in most cases. Uh, they don't, a person that does that doesn't have the, the intellect that they didn't believe in what they were doing to begin with. They didn't believe in the companies they owned. They didn't know how to research the companies properly to understand the, why they're undervalued and why at some point, you know, six months, nine months, three years in the future, they're likely to have a significantly higher value. And if, if you knew that, if you knew, oh, this is the process, like, you know, this is, this is the recipe is like, you know, good liquidity, low debt, uh, you know, easy to cover their debts, uh, cash flows are improving, except, you know, and a hundred other things we could talk about. But if you look at that and say, well, yeah, it's, you know, trading for maybe 40 cents on the dollar or what it should be, or sometimes 10 cents of the dollar of, of what it, uh, what you would anticipate it being valued at in the future. So I don't get shook by that because I can look at the numbers and I can, and I think about, you know, we, we had a dinner conversation last night about human psychology that like, if you, if you could think about evolutionary psychology a bit and, uh, you know, there's a couple weeks in this course where the, you know, for two weeks they talked about, you know, uh, logical fallacies, cognitive biases, and the first third of the course is sort of that philosophy of business or philosophy of entrepreneurship, the same that the, the, we talk together about the philosophy of fighting, you know? And, um, you know, if, if you had that, if you had that etched in your head of like, yeah, that's part of the process. You're gonna have some days are gonna be better, some days are gonna suck. You got to go perform both days. Um, you don't have that volatility of your emotions. You don't get all all shook up and tossed out like a pair of dice. You just have a, a, a firmness about you of like, you know, yeah. Actually, I actually have a, a good example of that that I love to show my children. Sure. It was the second time I fought a, a guy named Antonio Noguera, and in the first fight, I knocked him down like three times in the first round, and then ended up knocking him down and, and getting a knockout in the, in the second round. And I completely had outboxed him, destroyed him. So when we fought the second time, I was a little kind of cocky with the boxing and I was being a little uh, lazadaisical. And uh, before the fight, we were talking like, hey, uh, his triangles and arm bars are probably not what they used to be because of his age and, and, and whatnot. But his guillotine is still world class. So we worked on some defenses to make sure I was sharp and, you know, and, and on point about that. And so the fight starts off, I'm kind of dancing around and moving. And uh, I thought he was gonna throw a, a jab, he faked the jab and threw a really powerful right hand. So all of a sudden I, I went to go ahead and block and I bit on the jab and he caught me right on the ear with a straight right hand, caved my legs out. I fell forward, grabbed onto his legs and flat on my face basically. And at that point, all of a sudden he hits me a couple times but then he slaps me into a guillotine. He pulls guard and he has the choke it's in, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, oh damn. Uh, we're about a minute into this fight and I've been knocked down, almost knocked out. 
and uh, now I'm stuck in his best submission, and uh, <laughs> today's been a bad day. And uh, I think the old me before fighting in martial arts would have sat there and felt sorry, oh man, I screwed up, and this. But instead, I just cleared my mind, I looked at it as a math problem, all right, I'm in a choke, where's his weight? Oh, it's here, boom, I disrupted it was the choke, disrupted his weight, ended up on top. I saw that he left his arm behind, so I grabbed it, I locked up a Kimura. He then tried to trap my leg, I saw it as another problem, so I'm like, oh, okay, well, if you trap my leg, I'm gonna lean over so that you sweep me and release the leg, release the leg, got on top, started applying pressure, and he wasn't gonna tap, so I broke his arm. And so uh, I use that as a great example of like a living analogy of, of, of example of life, of I could have sat there and felt bad for myself, going, oh shit, man, I got caught with a punch, I'm almost knocked out, now I'm in his best choke. Uh, but instead of attaching any emotion to a problem, I just looked at it as a problem. Like, all right, well, what's going on? I'm in a choke. How do I get out? Well, I gotta do this. Okay, now where I'm at, I'm here. Oh, there's his arm. And just solved every problem as it came and eventually worked my way through it. Or I lose, do you know what I mean? Like, or you finish me, or you kill me, you know? But until that happens, I'm gonna keep solving every problem that's ahead of me and not sit back there and attach emotion about it and be upset, angry, or on the flip side, be happy. Sometimes you get in a good position in a fight and people get excited, just like you're talking about. No change in how your mentality is because you should attach emotion to, to situations because it clouds the mind. It's, it is what it is. Are you doing well? Great. Are you not? Well, then fix it. And how are we going to fix it in step by step? You don't have to lie to yourself. I think another another thing that's noteworthy in there, like, at no time did Frank say, well, I lied to myself about my situation. No. Nope. You just accepted your situation. It is what it is. I was like, man, this sucks. Yeah. All right, what's the best opportunity from here? Yep, you it's apply, a math problem. You, you apply logic, and when you're applying logic, you have to take the emotion out of it. And yes. And sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes it's difficult. You, you're in a situation where it's, it's tough on you, or even a situation where it's very good on you. It's, it's easy to just kind of become lax when, and, 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 and not... No, go into the fine details of the subtleties because you're in a good mood right now and you think things are going good. You don't have to, your guard is kind of down a little bit because you think you have the advantage, you know? Yes. Frank mentioned that at, at the beginning of that fight, he beat Noguera the first time. So he kind of went in there with a little bit of, of overconfidence, even uh, even if not overconfidence, you know, you let no, your guard down a little bit, you know? But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's not even just about feeling bad for yourself. Fr Frank was in the choke it, and it was you Noguera's know, best choke. He had to fight that off, you know. If, if he doesn't fight that off, Noguera gets to choke in more deep, and then it's over, you know. Wake so it up. You, have, you have to decide in that moment how badly do you want to get out of that tough situation. You're in that tough situation. How much does it mean to you to win this battle that you're in right now, or to win at what you're trying to accomplish right now? How much does it mean to you? Because depending on how much it means to you, you'll fight harder to overcome that difficult moment, as opposed to. If it really doesn't mean as much as you think it means, you're gonna find yourself giving in. And Frank wasn't choked out there. It was up to him to make sure he didn't get choked out and fight that choke but off. How many people would have, you know, pro fighters that are talented enough to be in the ring with with a guy like Nogiro, who's you know a really tough man? You know, how many guys would have made that assessment like, well, I've been knocked down already. I'm in his best position, and uh, things aren't going well. I guess this is the end. How many guys would have finished that there? There's many. Many guys would have. I mean, is it fair to say that more than half, like most oh, guys that most are talented enough to be in that spot, yeah, that's that why, would have been the end? Yeah, that's why, like, whenever you see fighters that do have the mentality, we, they're dangerous. We was like, man, I really have to put this person away. I, and I've said that when I coach guys at trans, I'm like, hey, he's not going to quit. You gotta put, you're going to have to put <clears> him to sleep, you know. Uh, a good example is Holly Holm. Mm -hmm. There was a fight where she fought for the title, uh, and she was winning. It was four rounds, you know, smashed, uh, it was smashing. And then all of a sudden, in the fifth round, she gets caught in a choke, and she's trying to fight out of it. And she fought until she got woken up. She went to sleep. And I always respected her for that. And other people are like, oh, you know. I'm like, look, she never once thought, okay, I'm going to quit. She was trying to solve the problem until she lost. And that's why I tell people, you got to solve the problem until you die. You know, you know, death or whatever's going to come. But until that moment, don't quit. Don't sit there and feel bad for yourself. You fight up until time runs out, and that's what happened to her. She went out on her shield, and I think that's a mentality that, that, that I've seen other fighters, and I don't want to you know, be a dick and say their names, but well, you know, they're quick to tap. They're quick to be in a bad position. They freak out and they panic. And I don't like it here. I'm, I'm losing. I'm getting tired. And, and the bad part is well, everybody at home can see that and go, wow, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Holly's a warrior. Holly, you know, I, I, I'm very close with one of her friends, and... Um, you know, Holly was a 17-time boxing champion, yes. a professional boxing champion, and then goes to UFC and becomes a UFC champion as well, which I believe she's the only person, male or female, who's been both a professional boxing champion and a UFC champion. And, you know, Holly's 40 years old. 
and, and she's still got a fight coming. She's, she's yeah. she still wants to fight. Like I, I think there's a fight scheduled this summer. So you know how they stop fucking around. She she has that warrior spirit and, yes. and very talented. And uh, you know, I, a comment I, I think all three of us have already touched on that it'd be useful for them is that you know, even even champion fighters give up at some point. Like you, you there, there's a subset that you gotta you gotta put them to sleep. And there's a lot of people that were, you know, I, I think you folks will agree, they were extremely talented, but they didn't have that, that I mean, they were fuck tough as nails, but they didn't have that same level of just like, no, you got to fucking put me to sleep or I'm yeah. going to keep moving. Yeah. And you're going to have to deal with that in entrepreneurship. If you don't, if you're like, you know, things are comfortable, if it's, not, if it's uncomfortable, you don't want to do it anymore, uh, you know, I, but you're going to have results proportional to that. You see that sometimes, you know, you see some people are so talented that they never have to get them, they have to get uncomfortable. In, on more rare occasions than some other people who aren't as talented and have to make it by being smart, also being good, talent, yes, but also digging down a little bit during rough moments. And sometimes those ultra-talented people are so not used to being in the, yes. in the difficult situations that when they finally wind up in that difficult situation, it kind of throws them off. It even undoes a lot of them, you know? You, you, you see that in, in, in fighting and you see that in, in sports in general. When so you, younger, you've got to be able to be the same both mentally and physically. You know, they say sports is, is mental. Life in general is mental. You know, your and, approach is everything. And another thing that I, I use fighters as an example, so people at home think that, like, oh, this guy never quits. I'm like, anybody that says that they never quit, and I don't mean that you don't quit in a fight, or maybe we've never seen you quit there, but if you've never had a moment where you've backed down or you failed or you didn't go to the gym when you should have, you didn't make that phone call when you should have, and I call those moments of failure. Mm -hmm. If you're not ever failing at all, then I don't think you're pushing yourself hard enough because I think all people, at times, we hit walls. We fail, we screw up, we make mistakes. To me, being a warrior is not so much the avoidance of ever quitting or failure, but how you deal with it, how you feel. Like, when I quit or I fail or I make a mistake and I fall short of my expectations, it's how do you respond to that? Do you go home and do you accept it? You're like, yeah, you know what, I had a bad day. No. Yeah. I lose sleep about it, I, I, it screws with my head, and I come back and I reinvigorate myself to go ahead and reattack and go, okay, well, how did I fail? What did I screw up on? What can I do to change? And you come back and you go back at it. And that's an important trait. I think people think that like, oh, well, I quit, I'm done. I'm like, no, man, so you messed up. Get back on the horse, go again, figure out what's going on, you know? Be uncomfortable with quitting and failing. I, I want yeah. to ask you a question about mm -hmm. this, Paulie. So, you know, I talked with Jake Shields about this sort of topic several times. and. Mm -hmm. You know, Jake in, in his UFC, in his uh, MMA career, there was a period he didn't lose a fight for about six and a half years. He, he won 15 fights in a row. And I know in boxing you won 21 fights in a row at one time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're you're a person that would uh, mm -hmm. you, you could speak to this very well. But you know, I, I asked Jake about his habits during that that time, like you know, the, the day to day, the mundane habits that wouldn't come out in a normal interview. You know, just mm -hmm. trying to pick his brain a little bit of that. He's like, uh, I said, what, what are the things that you had to say no to? to say yes to that level of performance that you're you're fighting, you know, guys like Dan Henderson and Tyrone Woodley and to Carlos Condit and so on, that's some really tough men, really tough men, that uh, in beating 15 fucking guys in a row, five of them were like those really hard, you know, tough mm -hmm. men. Anyway, Jake says, uh, he says yeah, you know, you, you win a fight and some guys want to go party for a month and he's like, I take a day off and on day two, uh, second day after the fight, I'm back in the gym. Less than 48 hours later, but, you know, he said, take one day off and then back to the gym. And, you know, what, what were some things like that in your life that, you know, other, other people say, hey, I, I won. I can go fuck off now. This. <laughs> um, there, were, there, were, there were times, uh, you know, especially when early on in your career, that, that, that prime of your career. If you notice the prime of an athlete's career in general, a fighter's career, they're not taking many days off because they love what they're doing, you know. For me, I started taking more days off. Um, cause I, I let some of the money affect me. So, you know, I would have, I would win big fights and say, oh, I've got time now. I can enjoy some money before I go back into camp. But early on, before I was making that money, you know, I was more hungry and I, there would be no days off. I would come, I would, I was an amateur. I would compete in a tournament, be right back in the gym the next week because, you know, I wanted to get ready for the next tournament and the next tournament. The streak I had was from the end of my amateur career to those, through those 21 pro fights that I won, granted, as when I turned pro, I was climbing the ladder, so the opposition kind of gradually started to grow again. But even at the end of my amateur career, I won the last couple of tournaments I was in, which was the New York Golden Gloves and the U.S. Championship. So I was I was a national champion uh, when I turned pro, um, and you know I I remember at that time period I would just come back from one tournament and keep training for the next tournament. And then I turned pro, I would have a fight, and I wanted to be back in the gym because I wanted to get ready for the next fight. And 
what you don't realize when you keep that consistency is you get better at whatever it is you're practicing. The consistency is so strong, but it's your enthusiasm and passion for it that makes it feel like it's not even work. You know, you want, you actually want to be there. You have to want to be there. You have to almost appreciate the grind and, 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 and live for the grind, you know, um, in order. And then when you're that passionate, you work hard and you also continue to make those improvements because your consistency ends up making you smarter at whatever you're doing. It makes you better at whatever you're doing and it makes your level continue to grow. So, you know, um, I always say that a lot. Passion and enthusiasm is, is, is your, uh, has to be the root and the key to everything because it's nobody will work as hard as they need to work without passion and enthusiasm for what they have, for what they do. I was living on my coach's uh, living room on a mattress, you know. I ended up like just bouncing at a bar. I'd been a cop, I quit my job. And Derek Moneybird presents the Ten Commandments of Wealth. Took, took the gamble on myself to become a successful uh, professional fighter and make it to the UFC or pride in that time. And am I making a sacrifice right now or am I just in investing in a better future? So it's easier for me to do those, to make those decisions when I think about it is like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, and, I, and now that you mentioned it, having to actually really process and think about it, I think that word sacrifice is kind of like, I believe it's the word that the ones at the top kind of use to make everyone else feel better about it. Because when you're at the top, now you realize that that was an investment. Was everything just golden and easy and handed to you, or do you have a little struggle with yourself along the way? No. Yeah, and within, uh, in 2013 and 2015, I was living out of my car, you know, full time, and I was too proud to ask for help. Like, how ridiculous is that? You're living out of your car, and Think you know it all. And 2015, that's when I kind of hit, I knew that I didn't know it all. So why not find experts in that and really shortcut that? I thought I was going to just chip away. I thought I was just going to read books until I was an expert. Mm -hmm. you know, I never really talked to anyone that actually did it. It's been about a week since I've joined the 10 Commandments of Wealth program, and there's so many interviews that are offered in this program. I'm inside the Derek Moneybird 10 Commandments of Wealth program. This is an awesome program that you're gonna love. I'm gonna use the principles and the knowledge from this program to help me boost my leads in my marketing firm. Buy this program, it's a wonderful investment for your future. You won't regret it and you'll absolutely love it.